from Revelation. And I was interested this week to think about all of the different images that we hear about or references that we hear about in the Bible to the lion. Um, we're doing The Lion King. We watched it the other night, and, and we're going to talk about it. I'm going to show you a couple of clips here in a few minutes. But, but this idea of the lion and the lion of Judah, and there's a, a story about um, uh, uh, Samson who reaches into the, the lion's mouth and pulls out the, the hive, the beehive. Um, there, there's several other stories all throughout text about lions. And I've always wondered to myself, where did they go? Have you ever thought about that? Like, because when I think about a lion, as a modern person, I think about, of course, Africa. That's the only place we see lions today. Well, that and in zoos, of course, but uh, that's what we think about when we think about lions. And, and I had to do a little bit of research, and I actually found out that, that, that lions existed in Palestine and in Israel, uh, all, all the way up to as most recently uh, as the 19th century. But it was only then that the Asian lion went extinct. And, and, and there was a bunch up until even the 14th century uh, it was when the most of them were there. And then they sort of went into hiding and they were on, the, on track to becoming extinct. And so, anyways, every time we read these references, the biblical people would have known what they were talking about. Because lions would have been in their midst. Um, so when you heard the, the story of the Lion of Judah that Ray read to you a few moments ago, and then now as we turn to the, the fifth chapter of Revelation... In the fifth verse, we hear this. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't weep. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has emerged victorious. So he can open the scroll and its seven seals. God adds God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, to the understanding of God's holy word. Amen. All right. So the past three weeks, we've been working through Disney movies, which is sort of crazy. If you're visiting with us, let me explain. Um, we have been watching a movie on Friday night and then coming together and sort of talking about it the next Sunday to look at the biblical truths or the gospel truths that we find in these movies. Now, again, they're not perfect. I acknowledge that, but... I also want us to learn that you can see gospel truth all around us. We learn a little bit here and there. But specifically with The Lion King, which we're going to talk all about in a second, I think there's two different ways we go about looking at this movie. On the one hand, there are some very significant and real ways in which this points us, this story points us to our story as God's people. So you'll see some images, especially the ones I'm getting ready to show you, that hopefully will remind you of our story. Um, and then on the other side, or the other side of the coin, what this story does, what this movie does for us is it reminds us of our humanity and of the ways in which we struggle, the ways in which we fall short. And so it, it sort of maybe teaches or encourages us, coaxes us into to acting a certain way or thinking about things in a certain light. This is not a new story. Uh, it was written and produced and, and released around 1994, but the story of the Lion King draws from Shakespeare's Hamlet as well as, as ancient Egyptian mythology as well as many biblical texts itself. Um, released, like I said, in 1994. It was much acclaimed. I, I hope that, that you have seen it, and if you haven't, that you've at least heard about it and you kind of know a little bit about it. And some people think about the Broadway play that is, is supposed to be very good and has won many awards. Um, however you, you think about it, however you've seen it, let me, let me give you just the background of the story, if you will. The, the setup of the movie is this way. There's the king, which is Mufasa. Uh, Mufasa is the, the big king lion at the very beginning. You're going to see him in a second. And he's voiced by the great James Earl Jones. Not a better voice in all of movies, in my opinion. Not the scary Darth Vader voice, but, but, but the good, kind, caring king voice that you'll hear. So he's Mufasa. And Mufasa has a son, Simba. And we're going to see the scene in a second in which he's sort of baptized or welcomed into the, the family, if you will. 
Um, they are served by, by several uh, little smaller role players. There's the, the dodo bird that's Zazu, and there's Rafiki, who is my favorite character of, of all Disney movies, who's like the, the priestly figure in the movie. And, and I'm going to show you a scene with, with him as well. But the other one that you need to pay attention to is the evil brother, Scar. Now, Scar is, is, is portrayed here. Um, Jeremy Irons, Irons is, the, is the voice actor here. But, but for you to go ahead and be thinking about Scar, if you'll notice, Scar is the only character in the whole movie, I read this, this is a little known fact, that has his claws out the whole time. I'm going to say something more about that in, in a moment. But, but this is really a story about father and the son. The reason we, we have chosen to talk about it this day as Father's Day is because at the heart of it is a, is a story of the, the Father's love and the Son and the way in which the Son grows into that. So we're introduced to Him for the first time. And, and here's, the, here's the opening scene that we have. All right, a couple of things that this scene in particular, like if you, if you watch this and you don't think about Jesus' baptism as, as the, 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 the clouds break and the sun beams down there on Simba being held up by Rafiki, that, that to me, I just, it just oozes with the baptism scene of Jesus, of the, the, the heavens opening up and the dove descending down or the dove-like figure of the Holy Spirit descending down upon Jesus. The voice that echoes down. And, and, and even the, the act, the breaking of the, the, the fruit of whatever it was and the, the, the anointing of, of Simba's head it is similar to what we do with baptism. And this morning I baptized a, uh, a child. We baptized Layla um, Burton and, and it took everything I had not to want to hold her up at the very end of her baptism like that. But the idea of, of joining in the circle of life, because that's what we do in baptism. That you and I join together into the community of God, the community of fellowship of believers. Even so that, that he, Rafiki scoops up the dust and throws it on his head. And, and, and we do that. We do that every year at Ash Wednesday, which we have a cross placed upon our head, reminding us that from dust we came to dust we shall return. I mean, just these scenes just ooze with what Christianity has been about for so long. A, God, a good reminder of, of what God is doing in our midst. Again, this is a story of the, the father and the son. And so while the father was, was proud of his son this day, he, he brings him along and he's, he shows him the kingdom that he will inherit one day. And he, he looks out and he says, everywhere that the son touches will be yours. Except for those, those places over there where it's in the shadows, you don't go there. He warns Simba, he says, just don't go there. That, that place is not a good place. Don't go there. Where do you think he went? Now, not, not everybody in here has had kids, but every single one of you have been a child before, right? And you know that when your mom and dad or whoever raised you, whether that was a grandparent or, or, or other fatherly figure, the one place they told you not to go, where was that temptation just taking you? You just wanted to go there, right? You just wanted to do what you were told not to do. And he gets in trouble. And his father has to come and rescue him. And save him from the, the little hyenas that are about to get him. And, and th then they have to have the hard conversation. Because when we fall astray, when we do things we aren't supposed to do, that tough conversation has to occur. Now we can think about this when we're growing up, but, but some of us still go through this sometimes. Right? That, that, that loving but yet stern, accountable voice comes into us and says, you know, you need to learn from this mistake. And so this, this hard scene to watch in which this big, massive King Mufasa is having to scold his son. And I think all of us have been there before, sons and daughters alike, doing something we know we shouldn't have done and and. and I don't know if you're like me. My, my biggest thing, I couldn't say this in the first service because my parents were here, but, but the, the hardest thing that ever occurred to me was they, they were disappointed at me. I didn't want my parents to be disappointed. I think that's a firstborn thing. Uh, that, that broke my heart. That hurt me more than any kind of punishment they could love. They could take away everything from me. But if I, if, if I knew they were disappointed, oh, that was killer. 
for me. We feel that. And you can see in the movie that Simba does that too. But I'm convinced that, that, that that's what life is like for us as well with God. That sometimes God has to intervene and sort of just put, his, put God's proverbial foot down for us. That we've gone astray. We've done things we shouldn't have done. And well, we have to be held accountable. And sometimes that's a hard word from a friend. Sometimes that's a, a hard word from a loved one, a word that we, we don't like or that we don't want to hear. Sometimes it means we get in trouble. But in the movie, after the, the disciplining, after the, the I'm disappointed in you breaks out, they, the, the two lions, the young and old, start this little wrestling match in which they're, they're tugging at each other. And, and you can just feel the love overflow. And, and you realize then and there that all of it's done for love. That, that Mufasa would rather Simba not have done that, but, but he did. And he has to be punished or he has to be disciplined. But it's all so that, so that he knows his father loves him and wants the best for him. Friends, that's our faith in, in Christ and that's sort of what happens when we, when we fall astray and when we do things we shouldn't do and we go places we shouldn't go even mentally or, or physically or whatever it is. It's, it's God wanting us better, wanting better for us than what we have settled for. Now, the movie turns there. It, it has that moment of, of disciplining and then they're, they're friends again. And then the, the next, literally the next scene is that the evil one, Scar, remind you, comes in and, and he is power hungry. Scar wants what Mufasa has. Scar is, is Mufasa's brother and wants to be the king and is jealous of his brother. Where do you think they got that imagery from? You know, we've been dealing with that our whole existence, I think. Thinking about Cain and Abel. The jealousy that exists between brothers. And so, so Scar sets the, the plan in motion in order to put Simba in harm's way. And, and eventually Mufasa goes to save Simba again. And only this time Mufasa is, is killed in the meantime. And, and, and we had people who physically got up and left during this scene because they couldn't watch it. I have a hard time dealing with it myself. I almost cry every time I watch this scene in the movie. Because it's painful. Um, but I, I want you to see something. I want you to notice what Scar says to Simba after, after the dust has kind of settled and, and Mufasa's there and, and is dead. Play, play this next scene. Listen how 1 Peter describes, the, the letter written, 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, describes what the devil does. It says, be clear-headed, keep alert. Your accuser, the devil, is on the prowl like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Because this is what the enemy does. This is what the evil one does. The evil one creeps into our lives and, and tells us that it's our fault that you're the way you are. That you're never, never going to be any better than this. And it's all your fault. And this is the reason why you've been set down this path is because it's all on you. The decisions you made, the choices you made, it's all your fault and you're not going to be any better. So run away. I'm convinced this is what the devil does in our lives. I mean, Peter was onto something when he wrote that. that it, it, he just prowls around like Scar. And, and I, I read an interesting fact. Scar's the only one who has uh, the claws out the whole movie. Just waiting for his chance to, to scratch us and to mark us and to, to hit us. It's really what the devil does. Waits for those little tiny opportunities to get a, a foothold in our lives. Sending us down a path that God doesn't want us to go down convinced that this is how the devil works. It's all right. Not a problem. I got a million of those at home. Keep alert. Be on guard, right? Just like that. So, the, de the, the devil, Scar, the, the, the evil figure here, sends him out. Tells him to run away. And he sends his little uh, hyenas to go and to, to kill him. And, and Simba manages to escape. And he goes and, and he finds this, this oasis and this place with, with Puma, um, Timon and Pumbaa, the, the warthog and the meerkat. And they sing this great song, Hakuna Matata, uh, which means no worries. 
which is sort of the, 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 the it's our problem-free philosophy, as the song goes, which to me is a, a wonderful tune, but, but it falls really, really flat when it comes to the Christian faith. Because we're not promised things are going to be perfect. And we are not promised that there's going to be no, that we're going to be problem-free, right? That, that's the other thing is that we, we've been given a bad rap because people walk into the church and they go, oh, you Christians, you think you got it all together? You're supposed to be perfect when you leave here. Or you need to be perfect when you walk in here. Either way, they're assuming something that doesn't hold water. Right? We're not promised anything's going to be problem-free. Um, so he's there and he's in hiding Simba is. And then he starts getting these little nudges and hints that he needs to maybe start thinking about going back. And, and, and his old girlfriend comes back and, and encourages him to, to, you need to return. The pride land has gone downhill. And, and, and then Rafiki, the, the priest, enters into the picture. And, and there's, I'm going to show you a three-minute clip. This is the longest one. So kids, hang in there. This is the longest clip. And adults, too, hang in there. This is the longest one. And this is so chock ripe full of stuff. I, I could preach on this all by itself for about an hour. I love this scene. This is one of my favorite scenes. Take a look at, at, at the, rem, the thing that he has to remember or is reminded of. He takeaways for you from that one scene right there. When he looks down into that water and he touches the water and it starts rippling a little bit and he, and he sees his father there. Oh my word. That's so powerful. We are image bearers, brothers and sisters. That's what we do as Christians. God's image is imprinted upon us, and it's not the same as God. We are not God ourselves. Hear me say that. But we, are, we have that image within us, and, and we use it actually as, as broken image bearers. Because we sin, we fall short, we acknowledge that, we admit that. But that doesn't change the image that was within us, that God has placed upon our lives. Even from the point of creation, what we were. Second thing, the, the whole remember. The bishop reminded us this week in one of the sermons that he preached, he said, and, and this was advice that, that I'm sure your mama gave you like my mama gave me, remember who you are and whose you are, right? Anytime you went to leave the house, we always had, at, when we were going on trips, remember who you are and whose you are. Remember that you come from us. You represent us, and remember that you are God's, right? That impacts the way we, we interact. Remember who you are, brothers and sisters. And we are God's people. And then the last thing about change, the, the, the bishop said this week that the only people who like change are, are babies with wet diapers. <laughs> Isn't that right? We don't like change, do we? And change is hard. Change hurts. But you either learn from your past or you run from it, right? And Simba had been running all of his life from his past. Some of us run from things in our past. <clears throat> Instead of learning from it. Instead of allowing the, the, the positive change to occur. Instead of doing the thing that we need to do. Which for Simba it was to go home. It was to return. That's the hard thing for us to do sometimes. Is to go and confront the difficult things that we've been running from in our lives. Some of you need to have conversations with people. That you've been running from for a long time. Some of us need to have conversations with God that just simply lays it all out there and says, listen, I've been running and I've been hiding and I've been holding this back for a very long time and I can't do it anymore. And here's the closing part. Here's the greatest part of the whole story. The very end, you see him running back and they have this huge confrontation and there's a big fight and, and of course the good guy wins. It wouldn't be a Disney movie if the good guy didn't win. So Simba's returned to the throne and they actually baptize his baby at the end or anoint his child at the end. But, but here's what we take away as Christians. Friends, the king will return. I'm going to go back to the Revelation. Revelation 7, verses 15 through, through 17. We find these words and the imagery changes. We go from talking about Jesus as the Lion of Judah to now Jesus as the Lamb. I promise I'm almost done. Hang in there. This is what the, the John writes to us in Revelation. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship Him day and night in His temple, and one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more, thirst no more. 
No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them because the Lamb who is in the midst of throne will shepherd them. He will lead them. Get this. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. The very end of the movie, you see the, the land is parched and dry and it returns and it becomes back to life and there's water flowing through it again. That's biblical, friends. This is what our hope is. Our hope is found in the fact that there will be springs of life-giving water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The pain, the suffering, the, the hurt that we feel, all of it's going away. All of it's going away. Because of what God is going and what God has done and what God will continue to do again. That's our hope. So here's what I want to leave you with. This is the reason we can look at the world and are not discouraged because it would be easy to look out at this world and go, my God, what's going on here? We don't need to do that because we know how it's going to end. And our call, you and I, we have a role to play in that restoration. We join with God in helping to bring about the kingdom here and now. We can have that hope of glory one day. Amen, we can have that. But right now, we bring about the kingdom here because there's enough tough stuff in life that people are going through that they need to know what we know. I go back to share with you what, what I read to you very beginning here in, in Psalm 96. But what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Sing the good news. Bless His name. Share the news of His saving work every single day. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray.